It could be that yeah. the reason they're oh. on these simple narrative loops oh. is because they are unable to think or ask themselves, does this person care? Like, does this person, what, well, why is this person interacting with me from their perspective? They are well, what's interesting is his wife isn't like that. She's very sensitive to what people are saying. Yeah, um, she I think, has almost I think the key is I, I, she maintains a relationship with her old sorority friends. And I'm pretty mm. sure they're pretty catty and mean to each other and very competitive. So it's funny because you, you could look at it from one perspective and be like, gosh, you're in all these toxic relationships. But then from the other perspective, you're like, wow, thank goodness you're in all these toxic relationships because it keeps yeah, her keeps sharp her and sharp. entertaining. Because the internet allows for new forms of brain rot, i.e. you don't necessarily need to interact with other people in your daily life. Yeah, you're not getting that feedback, in the yeah, training. Getting... Well, and we're so used to being through all these different scrolling consumption pathways, just passive information and entertainment being served to us with no requirement that we serve anything back. There's no reciprocity. Here's it is a question unidirectional. I have you. Do you think people with deep brain rot are really sentient? Or no, do you think that it's no. like not a big problem for them to no. die? Yeah, not a big problem for them to die. Would you like to know more? Hello, Simone. It is wonderful to be here with you today. Today, we are going to talk about a concept that we internally call brain rot. And it is something that I like proposed as a mechanism of action for a way that people, as they get older, begin to fall into a particular type of thought that makes it impossible for them to hold complex ideas. And originally it was sort of a theory, like it seems like this might be what's happening in their brains. Mm -hmm. And since I have had that theory and interacted with older people again and again and again and see it play out exactly like this over and over again, I have now moved it from theory to fact. And it is weird to me that other people don't seem to have noticed this. Mm. What people will say is, well, as people become older, they become stuck in their way. Or as people become older, there's some degree of cognitive decline. But what I am noticing in here is not a general cognitive decline, but a very specific type of cognitive decline mm. that is very noticeable. Specifically what brain rot is is when an individual reaches a stage of brain rot and you talk to them, all they will be able to do or what they will default into is repeating simple narrative loops that are about painting a picture for themselves about who they are yeah. and painting a picture to you about who they are. Mm -hmm. And so what these will look like is if, for example, being infirmed is particularly important to their self-identity, they will go into a narrative loop of something that happened to them around that particular topic mm -hmm. with any attempt to model the target of this loop. So they will not be thinking, how will this modify your perception of them? They will not be thinking, how does this telling them this further my goals? They will not be thinking, is this something individual wants to hear? It is. Uh, and so the question is, is why does this exact behavior pattern seem to happen so, so, so frequently? Mm -hmm. So Simone, what are your thoughts? And I can give my thoughts on this. Yeah, so I have a very strong belief that this is a use it or lose it dynamic. That basically, and this is regardless of age too. This shows up across so much of the research I see. Basically, if you use something, it will maintain fairly good condition, be it your muscles, be it your eyes, be it whatever. And if you do not use it, it will atrophy. This seems to be backed up pretty well in research. For example, there's, there's one study called Television Viewing and Cognitive Decline in Older Age, findings from the English Longitudinal Study of Aging that found that watching over three and a half hours of TV correlated with greater cognitive decline because you're just sitting there passively watching. Whereas actually a different study found that playing a video game did not correlate, like sort of inversely correlated with cognitive decline in older people. So like more oh, engagement. It, specifically also like a, another study called Cultural Engagement and Incidence of Cognitive Impairment, a six-year longitudinal follow-up of the Japan Gerontological Evaluation Study, aka J-A-G-E-S, Jages, found that engagement in intellectual and creative activities may be associated with reduced risk of dementia. Again, like use it 
or lose it. There's also another study called Cognitive Leisure Activities and Future Risk of Cognitive Impairment and Dementia, Synthetic Review and Meta-Analysis, that also found, once again, that there is increasing evidence that participation in cognitively stim stimulating leisure activities may contribute to a reduction of risk of dementia and cognitive impairment later in life. And when we're talking about brain rot, we are really talking about forms of, of cognitive impairment. You know, this this is... It's, it's bad. So I think that's a really huge thing. And that's one thing that makes me so against the concept of retirement, this idea that like, oh, I'll stop no, working. Yeah, you're consigning someone to death by allowing them to retire. Yeah. I mean, unless their idea of retirement is like, okay, well now I'm going to go, you know, volunteer and build houses and support my community, which is what retirement used to be, I think, at a time of, of what, more engaged communities. What I would push back on is you're like, okay, use it or lose it, but use what? or Use, use your mind. You know, challenge yourself. Learn I'm new making. things. The type of cognitive decline that they experience is not general cognitive decline. It is very, very focused and leads to a very narrow set of behavioral patterns, well, which to me it does not seem downstream. So I can give you a hypothesis here to give you an example of what I mean by this. Yeah. Uh, what it could be is specifically what leads to brain rot is the part of their brain that mentally, that does theory of mind of other people. Exactly. That is mentally emulating the people around them. Yes. Stops working because that's the specific thing that they're not using. It could be that yeah. the reason they're on these simple narrative loops is because they are unable to think or ask themselves, does this person care? Like, does this person, what, well, why is this person interacting with me from their perspective? They are well, you see this a lot from more senior, and I'm saying senior in a hierarchical perspective, people, where they just go on and, and have this problem where they're saying a bunch of shit that you care nothing about because no one is pushing back on them. They've gotten past that point where they have to actually keep people engaged in order to get them to do what they want or pay attention. Actually, I've noticed this as well. Yeah, brain rot, you, you do get early brain rot in people who are very senior in hierarchies. Mm hmm yeah. Um, I've also noticed it in people. If they're surrounded by yes men, you know, there are lots of people who are senior in hierarchies who are sharp as a knife and very good at mentally modeling others and very engaging because mm -hmm. they, they force themselves into positions in life where they have to. Where people are telling them to shut up sometimes. Yeah. Or keep up. Yeah. Keep them in line. But no, I've also noticed it disproportionately with people in bureaucratic jobs. Like people who work in government positions and stuff like that, mm -hmm. where they seem to fall into brain rot much faster than other positions. Mm -hmm. And that would make sense if it's that you do not need to worry about mentally modeling others. Yeah, I wonder if it's important. To, like, I think also having a lot of kids or grandkids around is helpful because they they let you know when they are bored. And you have to constantly fight to earn their respect and attention. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is that some people are clearly resistant to it. So we mm -hmm. were on uh, Jim Rutt's show recently, and he is my dad's age. He actually worked with my dad running the Santa Fe Institute. And they- He's so um, sharp. He, he, yeah, he, he talks like a 20-year-old. Yes. Whereas my dad has a pretty significant amount of brain rot already. Um, Do you want to say that? Because your dad listens to this podcast. He barely ever listens to the podcast. He's not going to listen to this episode, I'll tell you. And even if he does, he needs to get out of it. Um, he goes on simple narrative loops all the time. And it's not, uh, and it means that I'm at risk of it too. Mm, it's true that um, it probably has a genetic component, as so many things do. Right. But I suspect he also is somebody who hasn't had to interact with lots of other people that could turn him down for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like. Yeah, what's interesting is his wife isn't like that. She's very sensitive to what people are saying. Yeah, um, she I think, has almost I think the key is I, I, she maintains a relationship with her old sorority friends. And I'm pretty mm. sure they're pretty catty and mean to each other and very competitive. And that your mother was the same way. She was surrounded by like Game of Thrones backstabber gossipy friends. 
Like and in such a rot. world, yeah, you, yeah, zero brain rot because the moment you have some, you are immediately eaten alive by these people, eviscerated. They will, they will not only freeze you out and destroy you, but they will humiliate you along the way. And I think that keeps you sharp. So it's funny because you, you could look at it from one perspective and be like, gosh, your mom's in all these toxic relationships. But then from the other perspective, be like, wow, thank goodness your mom's in all these toxic relationships because it keeps yeah, her it keeps sharp her and sharp. entertaining. Yeah. Um, no, I absolutely think you're right about that. And it highlights one of the areas for people who are new to our podcast, we're quite against radical life extension. And a lot of people are like, well, why? I mean, we could keep people younger through like, you know, they're like, it's not because they know. I mean, I think everybody knows why a person would intuitively be against that for civilization mm -hmm. reasons. Yeah. People just have a harder time changing their minds, a harder time thinking after a certain age. And they're like, well, what if we could fix that biologically speaking? If this theory of brain rot is correct, brain rot is not a biological phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that's caused by environmental conditions that are more common among retired people than mm -hmm. unretired people. Mm -hmm. That's what causes brain rot. And if that's the case in radical life extension, if this can happen to any human, it's a terrible idea. Because one thing about brain rot is that once it's set in, like if you at all enter any stage of your life where like for five to six years, you're just not having people push back against you regularly, it's probably permanent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's terrifying. I, I think my argument, though, is that it's while it does correlate with age, I and and I think it also correlates with other physical aspects of cognitive decline mm -hmm. that I have seen it in teenagers. I've seen it in 20 year olds. I, I have um, too. Yeah. And a, a really interesting place where we see it and started talking about it a lot was in our own toddlers when they first started learning how to speak, when all they could really talk about was like, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Our our almost two-year-old Titan only speaks in loops about her top thoughts, which is, look, a baby deer. Look, a baby deer. And what's that sound? Motorcycle. Like you're just hearing a continuous stream of her very, very basic thoughts. And that's exactly what you hear from someone who is brain rot. They're like, well, you know, first I have to go get the groceries and then I'm going to take a shower and then I have to talk with my friend. And you're like, I don't need to hear any of this. I don't need to hear. I was, I was doing like what's other common brain rot stuff, like just going through their schedule from yesterday. Uh huh. Like, well, yesterday I did this, and then I did this, and then. Oh, and yesterday we spoke with someone who, for like, I was carrying quite a few grocery bags in the street. Yeah, and he went over for a long. And he's a famous radio host too. The names weird. of his childhood neighbors and their nicknames. And, and their, their nicknames, nicknames and what they ended up doing. Yeah, and he ended up dying of a stomach aneurysm and he died and of a heart attack at age 40. Over his company and and they, we're like, you know, we love, you know, you're a nice guy, but I'm carrying about 40 pounds. How could you groceries? plausibly think that we could care anything <laughs> about this? You you stopped us on the road while we were walking somewhere. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was absolutely wild. But um, it's interesting that that can exist both in very old people, but we also see this basically in toddlers before they develop a theory of mind, before they can understand what oh, we need to hear. Oh, that's a good point. They don't have hear. a theory of mind yet, so mm -hmm. they're just going on about... Well, Look, baby this is an interesting thing I've noticed about brain rot, especially at the early stages. So there's a later stage where it's like just narrative loops, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's yeah. just... I yeah. did X yesterday, or I did X growing up, or this mm -hmm. thing happened to me, and here mm -hmm. it is, without any thought as to whether or not that is useful information to the person who's hearing about it. Right. Some is is at the early stages. It is really, really, really focused on self identity reinforcement. By that, what I mean is they will focus on narrative loops that are meant to try to reinforce the way they think about themselves mm -hmm. through conveying it to you is they will tell you stories about themselves that are meant to reinforce a way that they w desire to see themselves without any concern as to, is this actually modifying the recipient's perspective of me in a way I wanted to modify their perspective of me? Mm -hmm. And without any concern of, does this other person care? And, you know, where you'll really get this frequently, I've seen in elderly people, is often in medical stories. Where they'll be like, I had X injury and I went to the doctor and the doctor did this and then the doctor did this and then I had this follow up. And it's like, why would 
anybody care? Why would anybody care? Well, you I know? mean, to them, it matters a lot, right? It's something that's for, forefront in their minds is their medical treatment. They just, mm -hmm. they don't realize nobody, nobody cares. And it's one of the first things that I try to teach our children is not just about this, but about pieces of etiquette. I don't say you should do this. Like you should, you must say thank you. I say, if you say thank you to people, more people will like you and be nice to you and you'll get mm. more things you want. And I, I want to make it really clear to our children that we don't just do manners because that's what you do because you need to be conformist. Yeah. You do manners because if you want to get nice things from people, you have to make their lives more comfortable. You have to show them courtesy and What's respect. What's the Emily Toast line about this? Doesn't she have something on like why manners exist or why etiquette exists? Well, yeah, I mean, roughly speaking, I, I have this Malcolm knows there's this like 1942 Emily Post book that I consider to be my Bible basically. But she basically explains that etiquette and manners are not arbitrary dumb rules. Like they were necessarily first invented in Versailles by King Louis XIV to imprison the nobility what what good manners really are is making social transactions smooth making them happen efficiently and successfully that's it so i think a lot of people think about manners as unnecessary scraping and flourishing and doing all these dumb things that don't make a difference when really it's about elegant efficient effective transactions between people and I, that's how I want our children to understand etiquette and manners. And definitely throughout this 1942 Emily Post book that I have, it constantly reminds people quite harshly that no one gives a fuck what you think or feel. And your job is to make them comfortable. It, it, it is... And I, it's interesting that this is just not something that people talk about today. Maybe we have an epidemic of brain rot because everything has become, oh, what you feel is the most important thing in the world. We've really shifted that frame. That's from true. Nobody gives a fuck what you think, what you feel, how, what you're worried about. You need to get what you need to get done, and that's it. And now it's back to, no, your personal experience, experience is tantamount. Your mood is tantamount. That is your number one priority in life. And now it's encouraging people. It's accelerating brain rot and essentially dementia in all ages. Terrifying. Well, no, and I think you see this in online comments. You know, a lot of the comments that are just like, when they're just like attacking somebody randomly, mm -hmm. they come off as a form of like early brain rot. Yeah. Because that's not a thing that a sane person would do. A sane person wouldn't think, I have a negative emotional reaction when reading something this person wrote or, you know, seeing something this person did. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'll be like, you're a weirdo or, or you must be like an idiot, you know? Freaks. Like, you, yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't do that. And to, to, to highlight how much you wouldn't do that, imagine if you were like talking to somebody and they responded to you as that. You'd look at them like they were like they had a mental problem. Like they they do have person. a mental problem. <laughs> but they, no, they do have a mental problem. But I think that people don't realize that in engaging in this type of behavior, they are really just exacerbating mental problems that they've already built within their mind, and they just get worse and worse and worse until because the internet allows for new forms of brain rot i.e you don't necessarily need to interact with other people in your daily life yeah, you're not getting that feedback in the yeah, training you can be stuck in self-reinforcement loops entirely within a digital environment well and we're so used to being through all these different scrolling consumption pathways and social media and in just like on netflix and every other streaming platform and through many games just passive information and entertainment being served to us with no requirement that we serve anything back. There's no reciprocity. Here's it is question unidirectional. I have you. Do you think people with deep brain rot are really sentient or no, do you think that it's no. like not a big problem for them to no. die? Yeah. Not a big problem for them to die. Yeah, well, they, they become bra brain rot is NPCism. Worse than generic NPCism though. This, so there's a form of NPCism that's just like urban monoculture to the extreme. Which well, is it's, just like, it, you can think of it like stasis. So those people could be saved if they were presented with memes that pulled them out of the loop, right? Yeah, these individuals, yeah, they're like in a stasis, but they like are reacting the way they're reacting because they're sort of 
afraid of judgment of society. Um, yeah, or they well, they haven't been given the mental and mimetic tools that would allow them to get out of those defaults. Yeah, but the brain rot is different. Brain rot is not like they're acting this way because they're afraid of how you're going to judge them. Mm -hmm. They're literally not thinking about how you're going to judge them. It mm -hmm. is everyone else's mental state does not exist from their perspective. Mm. Yeah, it's it's scary and it's bad. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you is the extent to which you think our brain rot epidemic is also manifest now in modern media. So we, with our kids, have been watching the Magic School Bus because we're trying to watch, like, find shows that they like that we also think aren't just complete nonsense. And Magic School Bus is great because it teaches pretty good things about science and it's also like pretty funny it, it's, it's a decent show the problem decent. with the magic school bus actually which i didn't remember growing up but every character in it is deeply unlikable except I, for that's a feature not a bug man i think that's hilarious no, everyone is made fun kids, of it's not like they have a personality okay like in some shows every character has a personality when you've got that's like true. a big diverse cast yeah no every one of the kids has a specific reason that makes them annoying and unlikable yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, you don't none of none of the characters is a self insert at all. You you are like this outsider watching everything happen, laughing laughing at everyone, but yeah. also kind of wishing you were on the magic school bus. Our kids, no, wanna, especially uh, Toasty, he's like, I want to ride on the magic school bus. I just love it when he says he, that. He said that. He says that all the time. He makes I want to ride happy. on the magic school bus. Yeah. No, but I I I some of these kids are so like Arnold, for example is so deeply punchable. I almost want to create like a simulator where I can just punch a grown up version of Arnold. Oh, they Janet, you want proof? I'll give you proof. Here's proof of what'll happen to you if you stay here with your stuff. Arnold, no! Oh, no! Hey, like Carlos, Carlos is cute with I, his dad I joke. All of them, all of them need to be punched. <laughs> Carlos, DB, with her, BD, with her, her. I don't know. There's the, according to my research girl, who's super annoying, but at my old school yeah, girl is also super annoying. I, I just needed them to do their phrase. Okay. That would be so <laughs> cathartic. Uh, I'd also say, I'd really love to see like a Rick and Morty version of the magic school bus. I often think when watching the magic school bus, this would have been so much more than Back to the Future, good source material for a Rick and Morty-like show, in that Miss Frizzle has so little regard for the safety and life of her students just consistently throughout the show. She is so psychotic in the ways that she treats them. Best thing about time travel is that it's easy on the tires. Faster! Is it just me, or is that a real-life Tyrannosaurus? Correctosaurus Ralphie, and the T-Rex was the biggest meat eater of all time. On the Magic School Bus. Here it is, kids, the Grand Canyon. Yay! Seatbelts on, kids. No one else was already wearing a seatbelt? <laughs> hey, we're running out of road. Where the road ends, adventure begins. Okay. Yay! Do your See, Arnold, adventure awaits in heaven. And there are episodes where she will just like have the students doing something and be blatantly flirting with someone she clearly has a past relationship with. Here I'm thinking of the episode where they are on the school bus engineer guy. There's also so many scenes in the show where when you watch it and you watch what Miss Frizzle puts the kid through, you're like, oh my God. Like it, it's genuinely more horrifying than maybe your average Rick and Morty episode. Can we please go home now? Sure thing, Ralphie. After one more experience. Whoa! Holy mackerel, the bus just laid eggs and we're in them. Look at it this way, Ralphie. As soon as we hatch, this will be home. <laughs> A salmon he went to court and he did swim. Mm -hmm. Salmon he went to court. There's your answer, Carlos. What? Is he some sort of car wash? No. Don't eggs have to be fertilized and we're gonna be the next generation of salmon? Get ready to dig in, Liz. Hey! The bus is burying us alive! Cutting an egg? Okay. Getting fertilized? Okay. 
Getting buried in an egg? Not okay. Class? <sighs> Let's see if hatching's all it's cracked up to be. Wow! I'm hungry. My yolk sack's history. Let's find food. Well, anyway, what I think is interesting about it, though, is watching it. I'm like, wow, there's there's substance here. I'm I am learning something. They're, they're talking about something here, whereas I feel like, you know what? It's vibes. Like, so we're in, we're, we're in an election year right now. This is not very evergreen to say this, but you know, it's 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 Trump versus Kamala. But also, it's just like I, I'm looking at what political candidates are arguing. And they're not arguing substance anymore. They're not arguing policy. In fact, whenever policies are referred to, it's more fake meme caricatures of those policies. It's not even the real policies. That's and funny. well, for example, when Kamala Harris attacks Donald Trump, her running opponent, about his reproductive choice policy, she doesn't even refer to his policy, which is leave it up to the states. He refers to the policy that was outlined. In fact, she refers to a caricature of a policy that was outlined in the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025, where she says that there will be national abortion bans when really Project 2025's policy only refers to banning a specific pharmaceutical and not even like, it's not banning all, for example, Plan B medications. So it's, it's a lot more nuanced than that, but that's not what the substance is. And I feel like shows for kids and adults these days to a great extent are no longer about substance they're about a feeling. They're about a mood. Even when I compare, I mean, Blippi is definitely mood driven. Yes, and and so I feel like a lot of this also is just showing a general degradation of human processing power. That we're not really modeling other people anymore. That we're not really engaging with ideas and morals anymore. We're engaging with moods and feeling and becoming more like babies. We're not processing. We're not processing logical abstract ideas or other people's feelings or thoughts. We're just riding along like infants, smiling in reaction to a smiling face. Am I am I wrong here? This is just I've been feeling this creeping dread for the past two weeks about this. Uh, no, I think you're right for a lot of people. And then the question is, is, well, how do you protect our children? And I think it's to put them in environments, online environments, where they're going to get pushback. I mean, I think, for, for example, something like actively engaging in a Discord server, and I'll try to remember to leave our Discord link in here because it's really good Discord server, is just a great way to keep yourself active and yeah, stuff Or like force that. them to only go on 4chan where everyone's going to call them a fag. I, I, I just, I, I think griefing is really good. And I love online communities that give you a hard time. Again, that's going back to like, your your mom's backstabbing friends and gossiping and incredibly cruel friends who are also very fun and your stepmother's like sorority friends who are probably very gossipy and you know very clicky like keeping them sharp i think and i i would imagine i'd love to see longitudinal research on you know the the, the cognitive sharpness and also ability to model like the the modeling ability of people with large families you know someone who has four siblings versus someone who's an only child. How do they compare? I imagine- I, I the bet you they're gonna be like, much better if it's right? really and, and again, I, it, it comes back to this theme of use it or lose it. If you are not forced to be strong, if you are not subject to training, you won't develop that muscle. Your body doesn't, we we are beautifully efficient well, and uh, designed to even example serve energy. of brain rot you see in an online environment, which is comments that are meant to reinforce an individual's view of themselves. Mm, but not I. change e. any minds. You know, so it's like, it's, it's trying to show that they themselves are tough mm -hmm. uh, or masculine or something like this is the common version of it. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be like, well, bro, do you even lift? Like, to somebody who's from a different cultural subset, that's not going to be like, I'm not going to look at that and be like, oh, I'm ashamed that I don't lift. I'm like, why the fuck would I lift? Like, what? that has nothing to do with any anything. Why do I why do I spend time with my kids rather than at the gym? Like, because obviously that time is coming from somewhere. So it's either coming from the time with my kids or it's coming from my wife or it's coming from like, obviously that's a lower status thing from my cultural perspective to spend my time on than literally any of the things I actually spend my time on. Mm -hmm. And so, well, they're not thinking about it like that. So in what way are they thinking about it? They're thinking about it in terms of they see somebody 
who society or other people online seem to be assigning some level of status or attention to. Mm -hmm. And now they need to, you know, attempt to, because this person doesn't correlate with what they think status should correlate with, Mm. they will throw something like that out there to try to raise their own status within this little hierarchy that they're fighting just within their own mind. You know, like, yeah, and you see this all the time with masculinity challenges within an online context, which are just silly. That's true. Yeah. I've noticed you don't get challenged in the same way as much, which is interesting, but I think it's because you're, I mean, people will say you look, I don't know, like a man, I guess is the core. No, they say that I look misshapen and I wear big glasses and I look old and I look nerdy and weak and just like genetically unfit and that I'm a four and all sorts of things like that. Yeah. Well, those are not, so, I mean, you think about what's coming out with every one of those individual attacks. Like what are they trying to signal with something like that? Uh huh. So you go out like, like, if you go, you ugly, like just to like a random stranger, like you look like a mentally deficient person. Mm -hmm. So like, what are they trying to signal by saying something like you're a four, right? Mm -hmm. Now, first, I would say to people, like, objectively, that's not true. If you want to see, like, what your average person looks like, go to an airport or a DMV. Like, clearly, Simone's in the top 1% to 2% of the population in terms of attractiveness. When you consider the fact that she is in her late 30s at this point and has had four kids, I really don't think that you get close to this level of looks with normal humans. But they, they are trying to signal... Either that they can get a more attractive partner than somebody like you, or that they are more attractive than somebody like you, or that you should not be assigned status because you are not attractive enough to be somebody who's assigned status Mm. or, um, I don't know. It's it's very interesting. Like what, or that they are angry that you have been assigned status in our society and therefore they need to attempt to lower your status. Those are the things that might motivate behavior like that. You know, none of them show a particularly high level of cognitive function in terms of like 4D, like how you see society chess. But then think about something like you're genetically unfit. Now that actually shows a bit more intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. They are trying at the most base and superficial level to understand our ideology. Like, okay, they're selecting for genetic health of their offspring, right? And so if I insult her genetic health and say that people like her should not be breeding because she's of low genetic health, that undermines their world perspective. The problem here is that it also undermines their world perspective. If they're like, how dare you eugenicists be having children, you're genetically unfit. It's like, wait, what? What? Those that that's the eugenic the eugenic statement. And I should note that we don't actually hold eugenic beliefs, but this is something we're characterized as holding in the media. We do believe that humans have genes and that as a family we will make genetically optimal choices. But that's no more eugenicist than like choosing sperm from a sperm bank that has good quality traits. Like <laughs> individual choices have never been considered eugenics, historically speaking. It's only society-wide decisions, which is what makes it eugenic and not a choice in who your partner is. But anyway, they're they're trying to sort of flip the script on you there without really thinking about it, but it shows, again, Mm. a fairly low level of cognitive function. But I think something we have to remember is how low the level of cognitive function of the average human is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Half half of all people are dumber than the average person, uh, as they say, which is sobering and disturbing to think about um but but the thing about brain rot is it affects smart people like it's not oh like yes 100 percent. because we're primarily mixing with the smart people and speaking with smart people our society is soberingly siloed based on intelligence to yeah i'd actually say and i hadn't noticed this until you pointed it out and this is going to change a lot of my perception so i'm glad we had this talk brain rot really does disproportionately affect ceos in people in uniquely high status positions. I think especially people surrounded by yes men and people who are not like shit talking. Well, I don't know. I, I, I would say that people who are surrounded by yes men don't realize they're surrounded by yes men. And therefore that is not a useful framing for this. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. So I can think of one really good example whose YouTube channel we're always comparing ourselves against 
who seems to have a pretty big, sorry, we're, I, I often like to quote unquote compete with people who we have some sort of a personal relationship or history. Oh, was. okay. Yeah. This individual has pretty severe brain rot, but they don't, they wouldn't recognize that they have severe brain rot because they don't constantly really, engage with other in intellectuals and famous people. Yeah. They engage with other intellectuals, but they do it in environments that are very low risk to them. Mm -hmm. And so it allows them to just go on narrative loops and then leave right which is really really dangerous you can think you're engaging with other people but the question is basically are other people regularly telling you you're wrong and stupid that's a better way to know if do you have to genuinely worry about being backstabbed by the people you're engaging with in a significant way yeah and yeah and meaningfully backstabbed like mm -hmm expelled from the group, shit talked, supplanted from your position of authority. So yeah, I think, yeah, to your point about CEOs, if you own or run something and no one can fire you and no one can take it all away from you, you are uniquely susceptible to brain rot. Yeah. And you may want to join some kind of community or do something else where you are a player, but a player at risk. There has to be some kind of Game of Thrones in your life. If you don't, if you're not playing a Game of Thrones, you, you are the jester. No, jester is sorry. They're way too smart and intelligent. They were like typically the most intelligent people yeah. in the entire court, weren't they? It's bad, bad example. Undo. Undo. Well, do you have any final thoughts on this, Simone? How else would you stave it off? I mean, the top thing that I'm doing with our kids, for example, which I want to just Podcast promote their lives. Be and have and have lots of guests. The problem is that I know people who run major radio stations and have brain rot. So yeah, I don't think I don't think having guests on a podcast or in media at all is protects you from so that that's that's a that's dumb. That's not going to work. I think maybe constantly trying to to go further than you should be going I think is a good a idea. Very large family that can meaningfully isolate you or push you away if you're being stupid. Like, if it, I think if we have tons of kids, that's going to protect us to some extent. Well, I'm wondering if we could design our, like, either family trust or religious trust. You know, the thing that, like, sort of governs wealth transfer all and everything can be built in a way that forces the sort of heavy competition and merit in a way that would force us to stay sharp. Like, the moment we turn our backs. Yeah, so no, I think that's important. Yeah. I agree with that for, for kicking us off our own boards and stuff like that in favor of our kids, if they are more competent or cunning or ruthless. Yeah. 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 Cause also when I think about anyone I, I can think about who is brain rot, a very prominent feature in their life is a lack of threats, a lack of imminent threats, but it well, doesn't it have to be real. Threat. Like with your mother, it's not like she was ever in physical danger or in danger of losing you know, her, her security or safety or health. It was always just these, these women will reject you and stop inviting you to their parties and you won't get to be co-chair of this well, thing. I or mean, whatever. one of the things we've talked about putting together is a discord of like-minded family, not like a discord, but like a group that meets, you know, every year, once our kids are old enough, you know, of other competent high level professionals. Well, we already have, I mean, like when families reach out to us and they have kids similar to our kids age, I put them on the index list, which yeah. is basically a list of people from very different cultures, but who are willing to intermix and have their kids possibly date once they become young adults. And, um, and what we will do as a list is, is it will be, it will create an online environment for all of our kids where they can engage with other peers who have been pre-vetted for cultural similarity, but who also come from like successful families. And by cultural um, similarity, we mean commitment to hard culture. We yeah, don't mean yeah. shared culture or values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ba basically being weird and anti-urban monoculture. Yeah. And through engaging with this community, the kids will be able to do things like when we say date within the community, you will instead of like dating on normal discord, they would be able to go and stay with the family of one of the people that they met in this community. Exactly. If they like a girl or boy, or, you know, they come to our house and stay with us for a while, you know, the idea is that you have this sort of sending out as a process of dating, but also in an environment that is to an extent controlled by one of the families. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a lot of, you know, overly salacious behavior, or impolite behavior, you know, they know part of the 
point is impressing the family with their manners and work ethic and, uh, you know, everything like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it really frames the beginning of the relationship in a positive context. Uh, but to maintain this network, you know, if we do this right, there's going to be a lot of judgment going on. So I suspect that will. Yeah. Be well, I mean, it was something you, you always talked about with your, your mother going to family gatherings where she'd be like, so-and-so is going to have our, you know, like there'd be singing competitions or something. And that, you know, the family was always judging each other, like whose children will be like the most talented and well behaved. Well, this was a really and... unique thing about my family growing up and my family culture, which gave us a lot of cultural protection. And it's something I want to emphasize with my kids mm -hmm. is there was this belief that, you know, it matters. Like you need to be better than other people, but the people who you needed to be better than were your family members. I love, yes. We talked about and, this once on a car drive that the point of comparison should the be family. the insiders yeah the people outside the family did not matter like mm -hmm. they they were they were they, it was not relevant like there was never and this is actually really interesting and quite different from some other cultures where it's like people was in the culture so it was in some like jewish families for example right they'll be like well sheila's kid got into x medical school right like why aren't you in x medical school right my family would never do something like that. They, they saw... Yeah, it was not keeping up with the Joneses. It was keeping up with the Collinses. Well, yeah, the, the wider family network. It was, yeah. okay, their kids are doing X. Why aren't you doing X? The cousins are doing X. Why aren't you doing X? Mm -hmm. The cousins did Y. Why didn't you do Y? Uh, and this can seem, or, or your, your siblings have done Y, right? And for people who don't understand why this is so useful, it's useful for a few reasons. One it prevents standards from slipping. Um, mm -hmm. Of my extended family, of which I remember I did the math once, it was something like of like 18 cousins, aunts, uncles, everything like that. Only two didn't go to Ivy League, Stanford, Oxford, or Cambridge for their, their college or graduate degree. Like, like, it's like, okay, that's the norm. That's the standard to what's expected of you. Don't go lower than that. And so when you're, you're, you're doing it by society, you know, it allows for, for things to slip if people around you are slipping, right? Mm -hmm. You know, do you have, you know, of my family, I'd say like the middling success level is probably runs a company that's worth over a hundred million dollars. Yeah. Middling is top point. 1% probably not necessarily uh, in terms of wealth, but I would just say broad success by our definition, like has several kids is generally happy is generally healthy is not in financial trouble and has a position professionally of non-trivial influence. Yeah. Yeah. They all have positions of non-trivial influence. And, and even with our podcast, I compare it. Like I was, I was talking to my brother about our podcast recently and then he he snapped back at me that one of my cousins likely had over a billion views on his stuff yeah. uh, and i was boiling at that point i was like no but you're right i need to do better the the one that he's he's talking about does he's most famous now for like his impersonation stuff make it up as we go along Already. it's so But he actually started a company that does AI stuff and they have a, a, a movie coming out soon called, what is it, Real or something like that, where they did the technology for it. We're around Tom Hanks. I'm going to put like a clip from it. It changes the time. So it's all filmed from like a single location. But like the time that things are happening is changing. And, but it's all done with AI because obviously they need to have the actor age throughout it. I'd like you to meet Margaret. Nice to meet you, Margaret. Nice to meet you, Mr. Young. I'm sure does fine. This news is captured. It's been the rest of my life here. And, and so obviously now this is like mainstream. And we haven't even gotten our documentary deal yet. And I feel, you know, um, pretty humbled by that. But that's the thing. Like, I don't. Uh, if I'm comparing myself to anyone else, it's like classmates, right? Like, which I've, I've done before. I'm like, okay, I have some sort of cultural relation to them because we went to Stanford together or something like that. And therefore I have to judge myself relative to how they're doing. But the other big advantage of this is it prevents non-family cultural framings from influencing my view of what a quote unquote good life looks like 
or mm -hmm. what status should look like. So if somebody was like, well, look at what the Joneses are doing, look at what everyone else is optimizing around. I was raised in an environment where it wouldn't even think to me to consider that as something like, it would be like, I, I, yeah, I guess they're doing that, but what does that have to do with me? And I think this might be very similar to the way religious individuals grow up who grow up like Orthodox Jewish or something like that. Yeah. If somebody was like, look at that person in secular world, look at what they're doing. And the Orthodox, you know, the, 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 the Hasidic Jew would be like, yeah, but why would I, or like an Amish person, like imagine trying to explain to an Amish person that they should be jealous of X person across the street who's like doing Y and who's not Amish. They'd be like, that's not the social environment I'm connected with. Also, for those who doubt the stories about my family, I told a pretty wild one in a recent episode about how when we were kids, our family was called by the other families in the neighborhood, the Adams family, due to things like my brother and I at like the age of five and four climbing up like three stories on the side of the house because my parents just had zero regard for my safety. And believe it or not, we actually found a video of this recently. Granddaddy, you're being paged, Granddaddy. But it's also made me realize, in terms of how I relate to you and our kids, how clannish my family is, mm -hmm. um, in that we come from, and you know, I've mentioned this, like the backwoods culture, which was a very clan-like culture or, or combination of backwoods and Puritan culture. But the backwoods culture was very clan-like. The Greater Appalachian region was very clan-like in how it interacted, and I've realized that I was taught to, maybe in a slightly like sanitized, high-class way to always consider the clan as the only thing that mattered and everything outside the clan was it just, it wasn't even like not desirable. It was just a desert, right? Like, yeah. um, uh, which, which was very interesting. And I, I think that that's something that we should focus on recreating for our kids, which fortunately we can do because one, we are broadly culturally aligned with our related family members and oh, they yeah. all have tons of kids. Yes, absolutely. Um, and We're lucky for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But if you don't have that within your family, I, I think that's another reason why we're trying to create the index well, is that before I go, I, I have somebody here who wants to, 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 to give his thoughts on this. Hey, Octavian, come here. Sit here. Oh, hi, so. Octavian. Hi. Octavian, what do you think daddy does when you are, are not at home, when you're at school? Then you just got a wife for me. No theory of mind confirmed. So daddy, daddy just sits I just sit here waiting for you until you come back from school. Do you think that's what I do? <laughs> what do you think that mommy does when you're at school? He does go inside and wait for me to come. Yeah, that's the world to these people. And what do you think your teacher is doing right now, Octavian? What, what's your teacher doing? My teacher's doing. Hold on a second. I gotta take the mail. I gotta. I gotta get the mail out. Active okay, narrative. Active narrative of what you're doing, and no model of other people. That's yeah. what it is. It's a reversion exactly. to a, a childlike state. Okay. Show them what you painted. But I think the scary thing is that many people are never developing that theory of mind at all. Whoa, that's scary. What the, what, what on it? earth? I'll tell you. I'll tell you what it needs to do. Okay. Okay. I'll do what you got to do. Okay. I'll sing a song and do it to the mask. Okay? okay. Okay. You put the mask on and then you sing a song. What's the song? Run away, the monkey jumping on the bed. One fell off. Oh. Mama called the doctor and the doctor said, no more monkey jumping on the bed. That when the, is not a monkey. That is a de demonic. Wait, being. when the monkey fell and bumped his head, what happened? Do you think he got hurt? Yeah. Do you, do you think he died? No. Mom, the mama 
The mama, the mama, the monkey does call the doctor. Oh, because the mama monkey called the doctor. Okay, well, that's good. The monkey doctor. <laughs> <laughs> the monkey doctor. Are we all going to have a cold soon? That's what I'm hearing here. I think so. All right. Love you, Simone. Love you, too. You're going to go get them? I'm coming down. Yeah. What do you want for dinner? A monkey jumping on the bed. What do you want for dinner? I'm not eating tonight. I ate uh, lunch. Oh, you went out? Yeah, when I was doing all the... Thank you. Thank you for making those deliveries. All right. I'll see you downstairs. I made pizza also, and I made everything to eat. Do you want a big pizza or a little pizza? Big pizza. Oh, no. Okay. I love you. Oh, I forgot to tell you last night I was changing Indy and she had a little bit of spit up behind her ears. She needed a bath. And I looked over and noticed that just gorgeous silver bathtub where we were staying and yeah. thought, you know, it would be so nice. Her, you know, sat in this gorgeous bathtub and just really relaxed for just a second. And I got in with her and I'm sitting and I have her, you know, like sitting on my legs and she's facing me like this. And I'm just looking at her and smiling. And then suddenly her face changes a little bit. Oh no. Yeah. She, there was poop everywhere. I was suddenly sitting in a toilet bowl surrounded <laughs> by turds in my worst nightmare being the germ phobe that I am. Just like, my one attempt, we had this chance, we were in this luxurious place, this beautiful bathtub. I'm like, oh, this will be such a nice moment. And I am sitting in my worst nightmare. <laughs> we should, uh, for the audience, tell the story about the the porta potty. So you should know how much Simone is a germaphobe and like a dirty phobe. She won't touch door handles. I have to open all the doors for her. She won't she doesn't really like, you know, handshaking with people. She's oh, incredibly no. germaphobic. Okay, continue. Yeah. yeah, touching doorknobs is really terrifying. Oh. Yes, I, this was maybe a year before I met Malcolm. I was 23 or 24 years old and walking around San Francisco, as was my want, just to do for fun. And I was up at Coit Tower where, at the time, and I think they've taken it out. The San Francisco used to have these somewhat automated bathrooms with rounded corners. And... I really, really had to go to the bathroom and I- and Normally was, you never use public restrooms. Oh no, I will just go forever and just not go to the bathroom and be in immense discomfort. It doesn't matter. But like, this was one of those situations where it was like, it's gonna come out. So either it's coming out and I'm spending the next however many hours walking around with soiled clothing or I'm using this public toilet and I get in and the door shuts and it's completely dark inside. And I'm like, oh crap, like, I guess there's no like activated light and I, I can't see anything because there's no windows in this toilet. Oh, and suddenly water starts spraying everywhere. And I learned the hard way that this toilet was in the middle of a cleaning cycle and I had somehow run into it just as it was shutting down oh. for, I guess, a cleaning oh. cycle, presumably because homeless people make it so gross in there that like they just created toilets with automatic cleaning cycles and so here i am in, in pitch dark in a public toilet being sprayed down with water i stumble out of this in the light of day quite tower is this lighthouse looking tower with really communist art at the bottom of it on this scenic hill in san francisco so i come out surrounded by tourists who are all just kind of staring at me looking like I want to die. Uh, Maybe uh, that was the last time I've used a public toilet, actually. Uh, Not, I don't think that's ever happened since. I just stopped drinking for a good 12 hours before I know I'm going to be outside for a prolonged period of time. Oh, and or wear adult diapers. It's great. Let's do it. Let's do the episode. Yeah. <laughs>